Well, hi everyone. My name is Marcus Heisler. I'm one of the primary care providers here at Summit Pacific Medical Center in Elma, Washington. And I'm joining you today uh, via live stream for our community education topic tonight, which is on the power of exercise to prevent and address chronic medical conditions. And uh, I hope that we can make this as interactive as possible despite the pandemic and the virtual circumstances of this talk. So please feel free to send me uh, any questions or comments, uh, particularly during our discussions uh, via the chat box. Uh, just a quick blurb about me. I'm a board certified family physician and also board certified preventive medicine physician. And I practice primary care here at Summit Pacific. I'm also one of the hospitalists, one of the core faculty of the residency, and I'm also involved in population health. Um, some of my passions include lifestyle medicine, uh, medical education, and being able to treat the full spectrum of ages and diseases that the family physician gets to address. So without further ado, uh, let's get to exercise. Um, I want to announce that uh, I don't have any financial interests that could conflict with my ability to um, provide you today uh, evidence-based recommendations, um, and, and they're free from uh, brand endorsements. And I want to give you the heads up about some of the topics that we're going to cover today. Hopefully you can measure the success of this talk by whether you learned the answers to some of these questions. First, how does exercise help me personally? Second, what could happen if I don't exercise? Third, how much exercise should I be getting? Fourth, what kind of exercise should I get? And fifth, what should I know before starting a exercise program? So first, how does exercise help me? All right, we're going to go through a couple of different studies here and several different diseases. I want to start with the biggest killers in this country, heart disease and stroke. So between 1996 and 2007, 13 studies were published looking at women alone, looking at men alone, and looking at both sexes. And they found that regardless of your gender, exercise reduced the risk of death due to heart disease on average by 30%. The amount of exercise in these studies ranged from a brisk walk one hour per week to a brisk walk one hour every day. But um, overall, every study was um, leaning towards a strong benefit from exercise or convincingly that a moderate amount of exercise benefited your risk of death from heart disease or stroke. Next, the 2011 analysis of 10 studies found that the average person who expended 1,100 uh, calories per week in physical activity during leisure time was able to lower their risk of developing blockage of their heart arteries by 20%. Um, the blockages of the coronary arteries is, of course, what leads to most heart attacks. And so to be able to prevent the blockage of those arteries is um, definitely going to be beneficial in helping prevent those types of heart attacks. And 1,100 calories per week, uh, just to make sense of that, could be expended easily by bicycling or swimming only 30 minutes, five days per week. And then a 2015 study estimated that walking at three miles per hour for 30 minutes, five days per week, could lower the risk of heart failure by 10%. And if you increase that to, say, jogging one hour, six days per week, you could really lower your risk of heart failure from ever developing by 35%. And this is just with exercise alone. And perhaps a, a point to make here, too. Um, obviously, there are a lot of different lifestyle interventions that we could consider for addressing chronic conditions or preventing chronic conditions. And exercise is just one component. And the only component I'll focus on tonight, not medications, not other uh, lifestyle interventions. So exercise alone being this impactful is um, a really significant finding and very promising for us trying to avoid these chronic conditions. Now, 
One of the biggest risk factors for heart disease and stroke is hypertension or high blood pressure. And of course, exercise impacts that as well. 90 to 150 minutes of exercise per week can lower the blood pressure of a person with hypertension by five millimeters mercury. And we're talking about the systolic number, so the, the top number on the blood pressure cuff when you get that reading in the office or in the pharmacy. And it can lower your diastolic blood pressure by eight millimeters mercury. Furthermore, resistance exercise, such as push-ups or lifting weights, can lower your systolic blood pressure by four to five millimeters mercury. So when you combine performing regular aerobic exercise with performing regular resistance exercise over the course of a week, you could expect to lower your blood pressure as much as a low dose of a blood pressure medication. And that's the power of uh, exercise alone on blood pressure. One of the other big risk factors for heart disease and stroke is cholesterol levels. We go to our provider every year and, and get our LDL and our HDL and our total cholesterols checked and also sometimes our triglyceride levels checked. And oftentimes we'll be taking medications or be prescribed uh, nutrition changes such as the Mediterranean diet to affect our cholesterol, but exercise impacts well. And in fact, regular aerobic exercise as well as regular resistance exercise can both lower LDL and total cholesterol levels by as much as six points, uh, and in the case of resistance exercise, by as much as nine points. Not quite as effective as some of the highest intensity cholesterol lowering medications, um, maybe getting close to those of the low intensity cholesterol medications, but we shouldn't forget about the power of exercise when we're trying to lower our cholesterol. And then of course there's diabetes, one of the biggest risk factors for heart disease and stroke. Now a 2013 study found that exercising for three or more sessions per week could lower your A1C by 0.5 percentage points. And most of us are, who have diabetes or treat diabetes are familiar with the A1C typically being above 6.5 if we have diabetes. So say we have an A1C of 7.0 and our provider wants to get our A1C down to 6.5, that reduction alone could be achieved by three sessions of physical activity each week. Now, if we increased our exercise up to five sessions per week, we could expect to lower our A1C by almost as much as two whole percentage points. Say, for example, your A1C is 9.0 and your provider would like to get your A1C down to 7.0. That could be achieved by increasing physical activity from nothing to five sessions per week, according to this study. And also, according to this study, the more sessions per week, the better. So we might expect an A1C to be uh, lowered by more than two percentage points if we achieved seven sessions per week or more, according to the trends that, that we saw. Exercise is also important for preventing diabetes. So if you have a family history of diabetes or you have high blood pressure, which means that you're at high risk of developing diabetes, you might want to think about the results of these four studies. Uh, and also this is gonna be the first graph that I'll show you uh, of several graphs. And hopefully we can make sense of these complicated diagrams. So first on the up-down axis on the left side of the screen, we see risk of developing diabetes. We're at the very top where it says one, that's basically the average risk of um, any person developing diabetes. And at the bottom there where it says 0 0.4, that is 40% of the average risk of developing diabetes, which means you've had a 60% reduction in risk of developing diabetes. And what these four studies show is that the more exercise per week you get, the lower your chances of getting diabetes. In fact, if you can achieve 30 minutes, three days per week of a brisk walk, you can lower your chances of developing diabetes by 10%. Now, besides heart disease, the other big killer in this country is cancer. Um, and the top three cancers uh, being lung cancer, breast cancer for women, prostate cancer for men, and colon cancer for both genders. Um, 
we find that at least with breast, colon, and prostate cancer, if you have been diagnosed with that cancer, but you start a regular physical activity program, you can lower your chance of dying from that cancer. Furthermore, if you haven't developed cancer, regular physical activity can lower your chances of developing many different types of cancers, not only the big four top causes of, or I should say the big uh, three top causes of cancer for women, lung, breast, and colon, but also many other types of cancers for both men and women, bladder, uterine, esophageal, kidney, and stomach. Now, uh, more common than, say, diabetes, which we think is pretty common, is mental health disorders in our country. Sleep problems, depression, anxiety, and maybe if you haven't been diagnosed with depression or anxiety, just having depressive symptoms or anxious symptoms is very common. And exercise has been shown to reduce or improve virtually all of these. It improves uh, function on memory tests, processing speed tests, achievement tests. It re shows uh, that exercise uh, can reduce your risk of developing dementia. Exercise can reduce risk of developing anxiety or your anxiety symptoms, if you have anxiety. It can also reduce risk of developing depression or the amount of depressive symptoms you're having. Regular exercise can improve sleep efficiency. It can improve sleep quality. It can improve the amount of deep sleep that you get each night, and it can reduce uh, the amount of daytime sleepiness you're experiencing. Regular exercise can also reduce need for sleep medications, and overall, it can improve quality of life. And exercise can add years to your life. Um, so this is the second uh, graph that we're showing you. And on the up-down axis, we see years of life gained and on the left-right axis, we can see how much exercise you would need to achieve in order to expect to gain or add that much, that many years to your life. The first uh, dot there, as the line curves upward, is at approximately three metabolic equivalent hours per week, which is probably about 30 minutes, three days per week of brisk walking. And then the next dot there is about 30 minutes of uh, brisk walking five days per week. So we're not talking about a lot of exercise before you already start to add years to your life. Now, of course, uh, the benefit tends to taper off, but it doesn't seem like it tapers off very quickly. So the more exercise you're getting, the more years you can add to your life. So in summary, if we look at the top 10 leading causes of death in our country, or if we look at the top most prevalent chronic conditions in our country, or if we look at the top 10 most expensive medical conditions in our country, exercise can impact in a positive way most of these diagnoses and diseases. Uh, in this table here, uh, summarized in one article, um, the bolded diseases are the ones that can be impacted by exercise. Now, uh, if we're young and healthy and um, we're not even worried about these diseases yet, it's still important to remember that exercise is important for us. It's important for our bone health and has been shown to improve bone health. It has been shown to reduce weight and uh, risk of developing childhood obesity. It's shown to improve our muscular and our cardiovascular fitness levels. It's been shown to help us on achievement and memory tests, especially um, when we're thinking about a hard test coming up in school. Exercise can be very helpful for helping your memory and it helps with depression. If you're pregnant, Moderate intensity physical activity is generally safe if you have no other chronic conditions, and it's very beneficial for multiple reasons. It can reduce the amount of weight gain you might expect to gain during pregnancy. Of course, there is an amount of 
healthy weight gain during pregnancy, but it is possible to gain an unhealthy amount of weight during pregnancy. And exercise, regular exercise during pregnancy, helps reduce the chances of unhealthy weight gain during pregnancy. Exercise has been shown to reduce the risk of developing gestational diabetes or for your baby to have a low birth weight, for your baby to deliver early, for early on in pregnancy to lose weight, or exercise after pregnancy has been shown to reduce the incidence or development of postpartum depression or the baby blues. All right, question number two. What could happen if I don't exercise? Broadly speaking, I want to ask the question, how much do you think our country spends on healthcare each year because of inadequate physical activity? If you uh, are a bean counter, you, you know this number, uh, fire it away in the chat. If you think you know this number, I'd love to see your guesses. So let me tell you the answer. Each year, our country spends $117 billion on healthcare because of inadequate physical activity among our fellow country members and ourselves. Okay, uh, interactive question number two. What percentage of early deaths do you think can be attributed to inadequate physical activity across our country? So the answer is 10% of early deaths can be attributed to inadequate physical activity. Most of us think about uh, overuse of alcohol or tobacco smoke. We think about um, cheeseburgers. I'm going to pick on those today. Uh, or other uh, unhealthy lifestyle choices. But simply sitting down can be an unhealthy lifestyle choice and um, it affects us all. So what is the cost of physical inactivity? Okay, this is going to be a hard chart to piece through here. So I'll walk us through it. On the up-down axis, we're looking at hazard ratio or the chances of having an early death. So where it says 1.0, or that baseline there with the dotted line, that's the average risk for a person of having an early death. Now, on the far, um, let's see, on the far right of each of those four clusters, we have how long a person spends sitting down each day in a chair. Um, and so where it says greater than eight hours per day, that's where we see a person's physical act, um, or a person's uh, risk of an early death increase, we almost see a 60% increase of early death if you are spending more than eight hours sitting down and you're not getting any routine physical activity. Now, if you spend greater than eight hours per day sitting in a chair, but you're getting less than 16 metabolic equivalent hours per week of exercise, which is, if you remember, jogging for an hour three days per week, you're still at a 30% increased risk of an early death. So in summary, the longer we spend sitting down, the number of years are basically being taken off of our life, despite whatever physical activity we get um, in the evenings or on the weekends when we go home and walk the dog or... Uh, when we do our weekend warrior activities. So I don't want to make the point that it's not worth it to go home and walk the dog or to partake in our weekend warrior activities. But the amount of time that you spend sitting down at work, on your way to work, on your way home from work, uh, while you're sitting down in school, those are all contributing to um, the risk of an early death and probably from chronic conditions. Now, it, it's, um, it's unique to say sitting down, um, and it's even more unique to say sitting down while watching TV. So we see the same graph here, except that uh, we've um, only talked about sitting down while watching TV. And notice that 
it doesn't have to be eight hours per day of sitting. It can only be five hours per day of sitting and watching TV at the same time, where we see an almost 90% increased risk of early death. Doesn't matter if you're exercising, if you're still spending five hours per day watching TV or three hours per day watching TV sitting down, that is increasing your risk of an early death. And so if we were to quantify uh, how many years of life we're losing from physical act inactivity, this graph helps us quantify that. So on the up down axis, we see the number of years of life lost, where at the top it's nine hours of year, or excuse me, nine years of life lost. And on the bottom, it's zero for the reference. If our weight is in a normal weight range, but we're not getting any physical activity per week, we are losing 4.7 years of our life. Now, of course, as our weight or our BMI goes up, as you see on the left-right axis, the power of inactivity is um, more potent, but the power of activity is still very potent. And so um, regardless of your BMI or your weight status, avoiding a sedentary life and getting up out of your chair, walking around, this really benefits us and helps us um, make the most of our lives. Now, I'm, I'm quickly realizing in the chat here, Elizabeth Miller said, I'm safe because I'm sitting down playing video games instead of watching TV. I love it. And we'll talk about uh, um, finding um, uh, some physical activity options that we can do in our house, too, when we get to the end of the presentation. Now, other risks of inactivity include uh, heart disease, stroke, diabetes, colon cancer, uterine cancer, and lung cancer. So. It's not just years to our life, but life to our years. All right, question number three. How much exercise should I be getting? We started to talk about this a little bit, um, especially when we talked about heart disease and diabetes. But if exercise is a medication, what is the dose? Before I can tell you about the dose, I need you to understand intensity levels. And um, this chart summarizes it fairly well. Moderate physical activity is a brisk walk, is biking, ballroom dancing, active yoga, recreational swimming, whereas vigorous activity is jogging, running, bicycling, greater than 10 miles per hour, singles tennis, swimming laps. But when I'm trying to explain it to my pediatric patients or, you know, even myself and my family members, I like to use the sing-talk test. So for example, if you are able to perform an activity and sing a song at the same time, doesn't matter what song, and you're not feeling short of breath or having to stop your song in the middle of it, whatever activity you're performing there is considered light physical activity. If you're not able to sing a song while you're performing that physical activity, and you're feeling short of breath, then we would consider that moderate physical activity. So a brisk walk would probably be difficult for most of us to sing a song. Now, I imagine some of us are fairly physically fit, and a brisk walk would not stop them from singing a song. So that person is actually going to be challenged to get moderate physical activity. But for the rest of us, um, use the singing test to determine if you're performing light or moderate physical activity. And then the talk test, if you're walking up a hill and you're having a hard time carrying on a conversation just like this, that's vigorous intensity. So if I tell you that the goal of physical activity is 150 minutes of moderate physical activity per week, you can cut that in half if you're performing this uh, vigorous physical activity. So instead of 150 minutes, it would only need to be 75 minutes. And in fact, that is the recommendation. We'll go, that, uh, go through that in a little bit more detail. But the second thing I want to share with you is this physical activity vital sign. When you go to your provider's office and they check your blood pressure or they check your heart rate or they check your respiratory rate or your oxygen level, 
you can also tell them that your physical activity vital sign in the past week has been X. And how would you calculate that? You would calculate it by counting out the number of days per week you had performed physical activity and then the minutes you had performed of physical activity that week um, at that intensity level. So, for example, if I performed 30 minutes of moderate physical activity five days per week, 30 minutes times five days is 150 minutes per week. And in fact, that's the recommendation, 150 minutes of moderate physical activity per week, um, which would only be 30 minutes of brisk walking uh, five days per week. More is better, but that is a good place to start. And the reason comes from this graph, as well as all the other graphs and pieces of information I'd, I've shared with you so far. But we see that the risk of death, um, of an early death, drops off dramatically when we get to just 150 minutes of physical activity per week. And in fact, it drops off even before then. So some people will tell me, Marcus, I can't achieve 150 minutes per week. There's absolutely no way, ever. Well, is some better than none? Absolutely. Some is better than none. Is more better than some? Definitely. More is better than some. Any little bit that you get counts. And it doesn't have to all be at once. It can be broken up over a period of time throughout the day. Instead of 30 minutes, five days per week, it could be 10 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes at night uh, on some days. It could be 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes on other days. And so it doesn't matter um, uh, how you add it up, but throughout the week, if you can achieve 150 minutes per week of moderate physical activity, you will notice um, a 30% reduction in risk of early death. So, what kind of exercise should I be getting? Well, let's talk about the different types of exercise. Most of us are familiar with the type of exercise that gets our heart rate up uh, and gets us um, breathing heavily. It's uh, usually the type of rhythmic exercises where we're using our large muscle groups, such as our arms or legs, like swimming or bicycle riding or walking or jumping jacks um, or um, jumping rope. These we consider aerobic exercises. Now, um, muscle strengthening exercises can be parsed into dynamic, where we're doing uh, squats and we're moving our body, or static and resistance, where we're moving weights, such as resistance bands or lifting weights. Now, there are also bone strengthening types of exercises where um, we're loading our body's bones with a weight, such as picking up a heavy backpack or a purse, carrying a small child or a gallon of milk and walking across the room. We're basically telling our bones in our legs to get stronger, to add strength to the bone material in our bones. And then there's balance training. Balance training is a type of exercise that forces you to use your nerves and your muscles together and the sense of balance that comes from your ears and your brain working together. And so types of under this category include yoga or walking backwards or standing on one leg. And then there are flexibility exercises. These types of exercises force us to gradually and slowly stretch out our tendons and our ligaments and our joints to the fullest healthy capacity that, um, that they're uh, structured to maintain. And of course, um, we think of stretching when we think of that type of exercise. So broken down by age group, the key recommendations, starting with preschool age children. Preschool age children, if you have these kids at home or in your classroom or in your pediatric clinic, you want to encourage them to be physically active throughout the day, obviously avoiding nap, nap times or meal times if you can help it. 
and it should include a variety of different types of activities that engage and stimulate their mind and prevent boredom or uh, prevent uh, uh, jumping out of the uh, activity and, and wanting to watch TV instead. Let me see here if I can move on to the next slide. There we go. Now, if you're a school-age child or um, acting like one or you have one at home or in your pediatric clinic or in your classroom, the recommendation is fairly similar to preschool-age children with a few more specifics. Again, it should include a variety of activities and really they should um, perform them throughout the day. But at a minimum, aerobic exercises should count up to 60 minutes per day, at least three days per week. There should be muscle strengthening exercises, at least 60 minutes or more per activity, at least three days per week. And bone strengthening exercises, again, 60 minutes or more, um, three days per week. And sometimes these overlap and that's okay. So it's not three minutes, uh, not three minutes, excuse me, three hours, uh, each of those three days per week. Um, but there's some overlap and um, also these can be spread out throughout the week. So physical uh, education classes, um, playing on the playground at school or in the um, local park, um, activities as a family, these can all count towards these different types of activities. Now for adults, I've already uh, talked about the recommendation here to achieve 150 minutes of aerobic exercise per week. But if you can achieve even more than that, if you can get up to 300 minutes per week, that's even better. Furthermore, uh, it's beneficial to incorporate at least two days per week of weight bearing or resistance exercises and to spread those out over all major muscle groups. Now, if you're an older adult, the recommendation is the same as for all adults, generally speaking. Or if you're an adult and you don't consider yourself older, but you have medical conditions that might infringe on some of these activities, the recommendation is still that you achieve as much of this as possible in a safe um, and uh, uh, adapted form. So for example, if you have to perform chair exercises, meaning that you're sitting down while lifting your legs or sitting down while lifting weights, that's perfectly acceptable. Whatever you have to do to stay safe and to um, work around your chronic conditions. Similarly, for pregnant women, the recommendation is the same for all adults, generally speaking. Um, as you uh, get later on in the pregnancy, um, there will be some adaptations that you'll have to make to avoid dizziness or um, to avoid dehydration. And it's generally advised that you talk to your doctor before engaging in vigorous physical activity during pregnancy, but moderate would be fine if you have no other health problems. Certainly after um, pregnancy, you could resume vigorous physical activity. And I more or less covered this when we talked about healthy adults, but you'll have this slide to review later on if you want to hit pause. So now question number five, what should I know before starting an exercise program? Well, I have my common sense slide here. If you haven't learned already from my slideshow, Exercise can lower your blood sugar, lower your blood pressure, increase your heart rate, cause dehydration, cause dramatic temperature changes, affect the way your body handles medications. It can lead to muscle breakdown, it can lead to injuries, it can affect your old injuries, and it can cause pain. And probably already all of you have realized one of these, if not all of these. But I say this because in some cases, it's going to be important to talk to your healthcare provider before starting exercises. Although there will be um, some of you that will not need to talk to your medical provider before starting or continuing your uh, own exercise program. And I don't want to create a barrier here, so let me go through that. 
are you already exercising? If the question, or if the, if the answer to that question is yes, um, then your next question to me is, can I keep exercising? Well, I would want to know, do you have any health problems? Diabetes, heart disease, a history of stroke, kidney disease, are you taking medications for anything? If you have no health problems and you have no symptoms of heart problems, blood sugar problems, blood pressure problems, then it's generally okay to continue moderate intensity exercise and it's generally okay to gradually increase to vi uh, vigorous physical activity. However, please listen to your body and stop the moment you develop any symptoms and seek medical attention. Now, if you're already exercising, but you have heart disease, I would want to know if you're, um, or, or say you have other heart pro um, health problems as well. I would want to know if you're having symptoms. If you're not having any symptoms, it's generally okay to continue with moderate intensity exercise. But I want you to get medical clearance from your provider before you start any vigorous intensity exercise. And of course, I want you to listen to your body and stop if you notice any symptoms. Seek medical attention, please. Now, if you're already exercising and you have heart disease and you're having symptoms, you should not need me to tell you this, but please stop right now. Please talk to your doctor and um, get whatever additional evaluation you need. Talk about other medications or medication changes and lifestyle changes that you can uh, incorporate to get to a healthier space where you can achieve um, a moderate intensity exercise routine without being at risk of complications. And of course, this counts if you have other health problems too, besides heart disease, and you're having symptoms. If you're having symptoms and health problems, please talk to your provider. Now, if you're not already exercising, can you start? Well, I wanna know, do you have health problems? Do you have symptoms? No and no it's generally okay to start a light exercise program and to gradually increase the moderate intensity exercise. But again, listen to your body. If you're not exercising right now and you have diseases or one chronic condition, but you don't have symptoms, it's still advised that you talk to your healthcare provider before starting an exercise routine. And of course, if you're having symptoms, please don't start, talk to your healthcare provider. Now, in summary, if you can answer no to each of these seven questions, then it's generally safe to go ahead and start an exercise routine, but always start at a low dose and gradually increase slowly while listening to your body. And again, those seven questions are, has your provider ever said that you have a heart condition or high blood pressure? Do you feel pain in your chest during your daily activities of living or when you are physically active? Do you lose balance because of dizziness or have you lost consciousness in the last 12 months? Have you ever been diagnosed by uh, any healthcare provider with another chronic condition? Are you currently taking prescribed medications for a chronic condition? Do you currently have or have had in the past 12 months a bone joint or soft tissue problem that could become agitated if you were to become physically active? And has your provider ever said that you should have a medically supervised exercise routine? If yes to any of those questions, then it's generally advise that you talk to your healthcare provider. Um, now, I think we have some time here to uh, watch this video. So, Brendan, would you help me out? Hi, I'm Dr. Mike Evans, and welcome to this visual lecture I'm calling 23 and a half hours. So I have a big interest in preventive medicine, you know, which can mean a lot of things from, you know, cancer screening to eating more fiber to having a good social network. And I, I mean that in the old sense of the word, but weighing less, drinking less, smoking less, controlling your blood pressure, cholesterol, and so on and so forth. So all these things are incredibly important and I wouldn't want you to uh, minimize your efforts in any one category, but I, I want to know what comes first. What, what, what has the biggest impact? What has the biggest return on investment? What makes the biggest difference to your health? So I did my research and I, I found an answer, at least for me, and it's tricky because, you know, all these things are sort of overlapping. Uh, but I picked out this intervention and 
because of its breadth, uh, it worked for so many different health problems, and that's what I found so cool about it. So just to kind of walk you through a quick list, so this intervention uh, in patients with knee arthritis who receive one hour of treatment three times a week reduced their rates of pain and disability by 47%. In older patients, it reduced progression to dementia and Alzheimer's by uh, around 50% for patients at high risk of diabetes and coupled with other lifestyle interventions it reduced progression to frank diabetes by 58 percent postmenopausal woman who had four hours a week of the treatment had a 41 percent reduction in the risk of hip fracture it reduced anxiety by 48 percent in a big meta-analysis patients suffering from depression 30 percent were relieved uh, with low dose and that bumped to 47 percent as we uh, increased the dose um, following over 10,000 Harvard alumni for over 12 years, those that had the intervention had a 23% lower risk of death than those who didn't get the treatment. It's the number one treatment of fatigue and of course the kind of outcome of choice there, my favorite outcome is quality of life which is really all of the above and, and really about making your life better and this treatment has been shown over and over again to improve quality of life. So the question is, what's the, what's the medicine and, and what is 23 and a half hours? So the medicine was exercise, mostly walking, so not triathlons. And, and let me just put it a different way. I, I think what I'm um, asking you to do is if you think about your typical day, so there's 24 hours, and so you might spend most of your day, you know, this varies obviously, but, uh, you know, couch surfing, sitting at work, obviously sleeping. And what um, the evidence that I'm going to show you kind of tells me is the best thing you can do for your health is to spend half an hour being active, maybe an hour, and that uh, if you can do that, you can realize all the benefits I've described in the previous slides. So let's just take a quick walk through some of the literature. So Stephen Blair, uh, he's a professor at the Arnold School of Public Health at the University of South Carolina, and he looked at this in what's called the aerobic center longitudinal study which followed over 50,000 men and women over time and uh, along the less left side of this graph is something called attributable fractions which is a, a kind of fancy word but it's the estimate of the number of deaths in a population that would have been avoided if that specific risk factor had been erased so for example turning a smoker into a non-smoker or a couch potato into a daily walker and along the bottom is the typical risk factors. You can see the uh, hypertension is incredibly important and so on and so forth. But the one that was most, that kind of applied the most risk was this sort of mysterious CRF, which is cardiorespiratory fitness, which is really low fitness. So low fitness was the strongest predictor of death. And, and this is important that most of the trials we see, to be honest, are funded by uh, pharma or, or um, other companies because they've got a drug for hypertension or high cholesterol or diabetes. And we rarely see see fitness thrown into the mix and so it's nice to see a, a trial that's not so uh, siloed. I, I, Blair's work is interesting. He also did another uh, trial looking at um, uh, obesity. What he found was you know sort of two things. One is obesity and no exercise that's a very bad combination and that's where we saw many of the negative consequences of obesity from a health point of view. But if the if the obese person was active even if they didn't have the weight loss but were just active and obese that was much much better and that the that the exercise ameliorated much of the negative consequences of uh, obesity. Um, so if exercise is a medicine, what's a dose? So when I think of, of, of dose, I think of how long, how often, and how intense. I'm going to give you a slightly mixed message, but essentially uh, more activity is better. But I must say the rate of return seems to decline after 20 or 30 minutes a day. So if you're being active less than 150 minutes a week or, or more if you're a kid, an hour a day if you're a kid, my flag goes up in the clinic. So my personal take on this is that um, you know, the literature draws a very broad brush, uh, and so we see big differences when somebody goes from not doing anything to doing something, and after that, the return is more granular. So if we took the nurse's health study, woman who went from zero activity to just one hour a week uh, reduced their heart disease rates by um, almost half. So you can break it down, so it can be 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, if you want to do uh, 30 minutes of exercise, so it can be broken into three higher intensity it looks like it's it's equivalent to less time with lower intensity uh, but I think uh, the, obviously the clinical pearl is mostly thinking about your your style and habits and your personal cues. So if you're only going to do it if it's pre-booked with friends, you know, I have couples that take a half hour walk every morning or evening to organize their life. A dog is a great uh, walking coach. 
Uh, the data is showing 67% of dog walkers achieve the 150 minutes a week just with the dog walking. And finally, of course, your commute, you know, getting off stop early, taking the stairs, and so on and so forth. So thinking about that, I'm just going to walk you through some quick uh, slices of the literature. Uh, the first one comes from Japan. In, in, the, in the 90s, uh, Japan required all employers to conduct annual health screens for uh, their employees. And so a large gas company in Japan called Osaka uh, used this to answer a great question. Um, so if people's walk to work was longer, did that reduce their chance of serious health problems? So in this example, high blood pressure. And what they found is under 10 minute walk, no difference. 11 to 20 minute walk, 12% reduction in rates of high blood pressure or hypertension. And over 21 minute walk, a 29% decrease in rates of high blood pressure. So. Uh, the authors calculated that for every increase of 10 minutes in your walk to work, there was a 12% reduction in the likelihood of getting high blood pressure. The second exhibit is uh, looking at stents. So this is something we commonly do down medicine. So you can see on the left here, the arteries blocked. On the right, a vascular surgeon has gone in and uh, put in a balloon, opened it up, and left a stent to keep it open, which makes great sense. So a German researcher named Reiner Hambrecht uh, looked at this with about 100 cardiac patients. He got half the group to exercise, and by that I mean 20 minutes a day on an exercise bicycle, and then once weekly, 60-minute aerobics class. And the other half got the high-tech stent and just their sort of normal activity. And after one year, 88% of the exercises were event-free compared to 70% of the people that got a stent. Um, so both worked, uh, but I find it you know, sort of incredible that the, uh, the low-tech uh, made a bigger difference. And you have to remember that the stent just fixes one part of the heart. The next way to think about it is the reverse. So what I call sitting disease. We know that being sedentary is bad for your health, but uh, a researcher named Leonard Veerman uh, wanted to quantify this, and he did so down in Australia in a big study they did there. They found compared with persons who watch no TV, those that spend a lifetime average of six hours a day watching TV can expect to live about five years left. I mean, that's incredible. But then I think, oh, who watches six hours a day of TV? Uh, and it turns out the average adult in the USA spends about five hours a day uh, watching TV or screens. So I, th I, th I find this fascinating that um, we never think of the TV as uh, something that's bad for our health, but clearly it's as powerful as many other risk factors for chronic disease. So I'm just going to leave you with, uh, well, I guess, two quotes. So one is Jerry Garcia, the, the, the singer who is the lead singer for the Grateful Dead. And he said, somebody has to do something. It's just incredibly pathetic that it has to be us. And I, I think that's true, that it, in some ways it has to be us. As Hippocrates said, uh, walking is man's best medicine. And so I'm going to finish by asking you a question. And this may have some personal challenges for you. So, you know, you might be very busy with work or kids or both, and you, or you may be uh, in pain or have other priorities. But um, um, my question to you is, can you limit your sitting and sleeping to just 23 and a half hours a day? So something to think about. Thank you very much. All right, thanks, Brandon. And I'll uh, take over the slideshow again. So uh, you can find that video on YouTube. Uh, just Google Doc Mike Evans or uh, use your preferred browser to look for Doc Mike Evans. Um, and uh, I'm sure you can find his videos elsewhere on the internet. Uh, I appreciate your question, Jen. And I, I want to address that uh, before I move on. And if anyone else has any other questions, feel free to chime in. There will also be time for questions at the end. But Jan asks, why is losing balance because of dizziness or loss of consciousness a prohibitive factor? And I did not mean to imply that it is a prohibitive factor. Uh, certainly, uh, many of us have dizziness from a fairly common and benign or uh, not very concerning disorder, such as BPPV or benign paroxysmal uh, positional vertigo. Uh, a dislodged stone in our ear, or from other conditions. It's just that on that screening questionnaire with those seven questions, it recognizes that dizziness could be a symptom of heart disease. And for somebody who has not had an evaluation for their dizziness, they ought to, just so that we can rule out it is uh, not the heart or some other uh, dangerous condition that would 
lead to a problem if they were to start exercising. So for those of you who have had dizziness for a long time and you've seen your primary care provider or specialist and have a diagnosis for your dizziness, then uh, that dizziness in and of itself wouldn't prohibit you from exercising. You would obviously want to be aware of any changes. Yeah, great question. Okay, so um, we, uh, let's see. Um, we're talking about, um, oh, you know what? I think I got out of order. Oh, okay, no. Well, let me start a different topic here. <laughs> so currently, um, the physical activity level in our country is um, concerning. Uh, according to a National Health Interview Survey, which is self-reported data um, published as recently as 2016, but spanning back down uh, as far as 2008, only about a quarter of women and about a third of men were achieving the recommended uh, physical activity levels. Now, uh, since this is self-reported, it is uh, likely that um, maybe one gender here is over-reporting and one gender is under-reporting, um, or both are over-reporting. I think the point is the same. We're not even achieving half of what we should be getting. Well, what about our kids? Also less than half. In fact, um, less than a third of our kids are getting the amount of physical activity that they should be getting. And that number went down between 2017 and 2018, which uh, of course preceded COVID uh, at the end of 2019. So I worry what this graph will show um, in a few years when we have the 2021 and 2022 data. So uh, my question for all of you and, and for myself is what can be done as a community to improve the physical activity of all individuals in our community? And I want to emphasize all individuals because it's not just ourselves or our neighbors, but it's those who have disabilities or chronic health conditions, those who don't have the same access to um, certain infrastructure in our community um, uh, and those who do or uh, those who don't have their own personal equipment in their home and those who do. So I'd love to hear from any one of you um, if you have thoughts. Or more questions. So I'll let you chew on that. And um, I'll highlight a resource here if any of you um, have already a voice or a platform in this community or you're connected uh, with those who do, such as community leaders or um, institutional organizational leaders at schools, churches, uh, health clubs, uh, book clubs. The community guide uh, which is published online and there's uh, free access to all, um, publishes a guide of recommendations based on the evidence that would impact the community's physical activity level. And so they have a rating system here that's fairly simple. A green circle means there's sufficient evidence to recommend and a yellow diamond means that there's insufficient evidence. Either there's not enough data and more studies need to be done, or the studies that have been done are inconclusive or show no benefit. Now, the second question I want to ask us all for either personal reflection, or if you found a strategy that's been successful with your family, please feel free, uh, free, feel free to share it in the chat. And that's, what can be done within your household to improve the physical activity of all individuals and credit to Cindy Beck for adding the mention about our pets. So something to think about and chew on. And perhaps a resource um, when you think about that with your family 
is the activity planner um, produced by uh, the same federal organization that developed the physical activity guidelines. And um, I want to show you uh, this website too. Because um, by just going to health.gov slash move your way slash activity hyphen planner, you can um, find ideas for activities that your family can partake in. And you can select some modifiers. Maybe you want to sleep better, ease pain, be a role model for your family. And then if you're looking for specific types of activities, You can find, based on those, several ideas for activities. And it'll show you um, when you add to your plan here how close you get towards that overall goal. OK. Um, Thank you all for your time. And uh, Daniel Hooper recommends adding a daily catch-up walk. I love that. I feel like every day I'm having to play catch-up with my physical activity. Jane recommends uh, finding things that you can do while watching TV. That's brilliant. All of us get our news or our entertainment, our relaxation from the TV eventually, uh, maybe every day of the week or maybe one day of the week. Uh, maybe some of us uh, aren't watching TV, but we're doing something else sedentary that could be active and finding things to do uh, while performing that sedentary activity is a really clever idea. Thanks, Jan. And I think I'll uh, remain here for um, maybe uh, until the end of the hour in case there are any other questions or ideas. Stretching in the shower, right, Cindy? I like that idea. I usually forget to stretch, and it's hard to stretch when it's cold or when my joints are cold. So when there's hot water running over my joints, I think that's a great idea for improving my own flexibility. I'm going to slowly toggle through my references so that those who are viewing this video later can pause and look at any of the sources that they might want. Well, thank you all for your engagement and um, making this a uh, interactive activity. I appreciated all of your participation. And Cindy, I don't know if you have any closing remarks that you want our participants to be aware of, upcoming events.
Okay, well, be safe, everybody. Stay healthy. And uh, please uh, look for opportunities to increase your level of physical activity. Bye, everyone.